Yeah. I'm really happy to have uh, uh, during this moment two amazing guests. So the first one that you will hear during 20 minutes is Amrita. Amrita is Senior Venture Capital Business Development Manager at Amazon Web Services. And she's been uh, working hand in hand with the top 10 VCs to help their startup scale. Uh, and she will give a 20 minute, very pragmatic presentation on how to strategy with a fun perspective. And then she will be interviewing Bartosz uh, from Alven, another great VC. And together, uh, they will uh, they will explain and let us know more about how to uh, fundraise, even though it is uh, the, uh, a, a, a very hard period. Uh, if you have any question, you can uh, put it in the in the chat. Uh, now it's a moment for Amrita. I'm leaving. Bartosz is leaving, and in 20 minutes, Bartosz will be back. See you soon. See you. See you later. Good luck, Amrita. Thank you, Alice. Hi, everyone, and welcome to this session. So before getting started, I just want to preface this by saying that in terms of our mission to help startup founders build great businesses, AWS and the family are completely aligned, 100%. So we're extremely happy to be partnering with the family today to bring you this awesome virtual event. Um, and I really hope that you'll get some great content from these sessions today. So again, the title of my session is Strategies for Startup Leaders During Uncertain Times. Um, a little bit about myself. So as Alice told you, I'm currently um, the Venture Capital Business Development Manager for AWS France. So basically I take care of the top 10 funds uh, in France and help their portfolio startup scale using AWS. Prior to that, I was myself a venture capitalist. I worked as an investment director in a corporate VC fund uh, for the Aaron Heap Group, where I invested in startups um, across the world, uh, primarily in North America and Europe, across different sectors like industrial IoT, digital health, ag tech, et cetera. In addition to that, I've been a mentor for Techstars programs in Paris and Oslo. And you know, in terms of my own educational background, I'm a mathematician by training. So again, um, just a little bit of the lay of the land. What are we going to be covering in the next hour? So my own keynote presentation will be um, somewhere between 20 and 25 minutes, where I'll be talking to you about the fundamental nature of market uncertainties. Uh, I'll be giving you some mental models to think about robustness and anti-fragility, the concept that I'll be introducing to you. Then we'll be talking about practical wartime CEO strategies. And finally, I'll be ending with some helpful AWS resources for you. The second part of this session, which I'm most excited about, will be an interview with our friend Bartosz, who's a principal at Alvin, and we'll be talking about many current topics which will be of interest to you. And then in the final 10 minutes or so, we'll be doing Q&A from the audience, so feel free to type your questions into the chat and we'll be taking them at the end. So now let's start talking about the fundamental nature of market uncertainties. So I think over the last few weeks, you've been hearing the term black swan quite a bit. So Sequoia Capital famously sent an email to all its founders about how to weather black storm events. Where does this term come from? So basically in 2007, um, a very famous New York trader called Nassim Nicholas Taleb, who happens to be a professor of risk engineering at NYU, the school that I went to, wrote this book called The Black Swan. Uh, and in this book, you know, the book became very famous because, among other things, he predicted that the 2008 financial crisis would occur. So then what's the black swan? It's basically a totally unpredictable event, um, an outlier, totally beyond the normal range of expectations. Secondly, it causes massive impact. And thirdly, despite the fact that it's inherently unpredictable, after the fact, people make it seem like it's explainable or predictable. So what about the current situation? What color swan is it? So to the left, you'll see uh, basically a chapter from Nassim Taleb's book where we've highlighted you know, the parts um, that pertain to the current crisis. And you will see that the current situation is a white swan, not a black swan event. Um, and Taleb actually confirmed this uh, in an interview to Bloomberg in early March this year. People often attach the black swan label to any event that they didn't see coming 
or something that holds consequences that has an impact larger than what they had assumed initially. And the current situation is very much a product of our hyper-connected world, the fact that people travel and that pandemics you know, occurring, originating in one area can spread very quickly to other parts of the world. So white swan, not black swan. Regardless of all of this, there is something that's undeniably true, which is that people tend to overestimate what they know and what probabilities they can calculate uh, amongst you know, market situations. So for example, um, you know, when you think about risk fundamentally, risk is something where you basically need to know the outcome of a particular event and you need to know the probabilities that are attached to that event. So, you know, in terms of the market, uh, you can't always know every kind of risk, right? Um, in the worst of cases, we are dealing, uh, hold on, being told that my slide is stuck. So I'm going to, do you see my slide now? Okay. Um, hold on, I'm going to keep talking and hopefully this will um, come back. So anyway, so the world that we're living in um, basically holds you know, risks that we don't fundamentally know much about. We navigate in a world uh, full of ambiguity and uncertainty in the, in the best of cases. And in the worst of cases, we're dealing with a world where we have a lot of ignorance. So you know, we're dealing with unknown unknowns. When you don't know what it is that you don't know, how can you possibly estimate the risks associated with it? And our current crisis is a very complex situation because there are three things going on. First of all, it's a global event. Secondly, it's fundamentally unquantifiable in terms of the damage. And thirdly, it's neither just a supply side problem nor just a demand side problem, it's both. So how do you basically build robustness or even better anti-fragility in this situation? So if you think about the word fragility, the opposite of it is not robust, but the word anti-fragile. So the same author, Nassim Nicholas Taleb, wrote another book called Anti-Fragile, or Things That Gain From Disorder. So a fragile system obviously is damaged by disorder. A robust one is resilient or comes out undamaged. And then an anti-fragile system is one that benefits from disorder. So while anti-fragility is a complex mathematical term, you can think about it maybe in terms of optionality, which is a closely related concept. So optionality is basically the sum value of all the options that are created by a decision. So if a decision gives you no net new options, then it gives you zero optionality. So anything that locks you into a single outcome is basically not very good in terms of giving you anti-fragility. So if you think of how early stage VCs create optionality for themselves, they do it in three ways. They'll invest in a team that's strong technically, that has sound business judgment, and thirdly, something that addresses a huge market opportunity. So this means that even though the founders from the get-go might not know where they're going, they're going to be able to figure out stuff along the way and make money for the VC. So if you look at what's going on in the market today, let's say you know the investment market or macro trends, uh, let's try to see what the likely fallout will be for startups. So on the one hand, you know, VCs today are very much focused on helping their portfolio companies because that's normal. They've invested in them and they don't want these companies to go bust. This means that they are kind of unlikely to consider totally new companies now once they've never met, right? Also for ongoing deals, which VCs were considering you know, before February or March, let's say, they will now be looking at them through the lens of how is this business going to be impacted by the current situation, right? So deals are going to take longer to close. Some sectors, as we know, uh, have really shrunken, you know, tourism or travel while others like game tech, um, you know, telehealth, et cetera, are flourishing. So VCs are likely to focus on newer investment areas, maybe. The fourth point is kind of subtle. So you know, VCs have their own investors. So these investors allocate funds across a bunch of asset classes, VCs being one of them. But given that public markets have shrunken, the LPs are going to be proportionately over allocated in the VC asset class. So they're going to want to correct for that which means that VCs themselves are going to have trouble raising new capital in, in the few months to come, let's say. 
final thing, as you all know, we're in a bear situation right now, bear markets. Markets are down 20 to 40, 25 to 40%. So valuation multiples are going to go down as well. You can't expect bull market valuations in a bear market. So what's the conclusion for startups? In order to create optionality, they need to conserve cash, become lean, and pivot if necessary. So here's the mindset that I want to give you. And really, if there's only one thing you take away from the presentation, it's all on this slide. The five things that you need to be doing right now as a wartime CEO Yes, that's right. You're now a wartime CEO, so peacetime tactics are not going to cut it. One, do not run out of cash. Two, communicate with all your key stakeholders. Three, consider all sources of funding. Four, you know, this is really important. Do take care of yourself and your team physically. And five, rethink your business and try to re-engineer it to be anti-fragile. Now I'm going to be going through these tactics one by one. In terms of making your cash last, you need to do that at least for the next 12 months. Some VCs say 18 months, but definitely 12 months. So how do you do that? You basically stress test your P&L and liquidity. How do you do that? Take your monthly recurring revenue. So just you know what you earn per month that's recurring on a recurring basis, and you slash it down by 30%, 40%, 50%, et cetera. That's a real stress test. Using this, Put together a weekly cash forecast. You know, know your bank balance at all times. And please calculate your cash out date based on your pessimistic scenario. So you're, when you slash your revenue by 50%, let's say. Then work backwards from that cash out date and do an expense triage. So rank customers, get rid of those that are too expensive to serve you know, for the revenues that they're bringing you. Eliminate all kinds of overhead. Eliminate marketing spend. Freeze perks for your employees, lock down credit cards. Obviously, personnel costs form the bulk of your expenses as a startup. So, you know, salary cuts for founders across the board is kind of a no brainer, but you might have to make some very hard decisions like laying off employees or furloughs. So, these are tough decisions, and if you need to let go of people, you need to do it fast, but do it with compassion. Try to figure out what your minimal viable team is. You know, the, the number of people that will help you put product out um, and not completely stifle future growth. Um, so think hard about that. And to compensate people that are taking pay cuts, think about giving them stock options. Secondly, you know, in terms of communication, discuss your plans with your employees, investors, and your key customers and vendors. So first, you know, plan individual meetings as well as all hands meetings with all your employees to reset them you know given the, the the times that we're in secondly share your high and low forecasts with your investors thirdly talk to your key customers and vendors you need to tighten accounts receivable and accounts payable to improve your cash cycle so for instance you might consider giving your customers a five percent discount if they pay you early and similarly, try to negotiate longer payment terms with your vendors if possible. Finally, this is very important, index on transparency with everyone. A metaphor that I really like in this respect is something that Stanford professor Tina Seeley shared, where she talks about you know, the, the level of trust between two individuals is a container of clear water. And any interaction that you might have with this other person that's negative or trust destroying as a drop of ink that you would put in that water. And in order to undo the damage, you would have to pour back clear water to undo it. So just think about this metaphor for a second. Once you've done a trust destroying you know, action, how much more clear water do you need to put in to, so that the water is no longer tainted? That kind of helps you think about you know, how important it is to preserve trust with your employees, your investors, and your key stakeholders. Now, consider all sources of funding. Um, as I told you, fresh VC funding will be challenging, but if you had started the process before March, you know, continue discussing with the VCs, but remember that you might have to raise at a lower valuation. It's going to be easier for people who had raised before to ask for a bridge or an insider-led round from your existing investors, but you need to align your investors and give them time to plan. So start doing that ASAP. It could take you, you know, a few months to get that going. If you have access to a line of credit today, please use it. You might consider interest payments to be a negative thing, 
But believe me, the additional optionality that it will create for you down the line offsets the interest payments. And finally, you know, depending on where you are, government schemes or disaster relief programs might be available to you. Over here, I've included a link for uh, French startups uh, to see what the government's offering them at the moment. Take care of your physical and mental well-being, obviously. So, you know, make sleep and exercise a priority. Uh, your decision-making capacity depends on it as a startup leader, and we need you to be in top shape to get your team through this. Keep your team morale high. So organize virtual cocktails, uh, stay connected to your team. And also remember that you're not going through this alone. Uh, the entire world over, there are founders, there are CTOs, there are other people that are in this. So participate in virtual forums to trade wartime stories and get advice. Finally, uh, let's talk about rethinking your business. Let's say, you know, in, in another six to 12 months time, this situation um, is no longer, um, you know, no longer holds true. But do not fall into the linear thinking trap uh, of thinking that things will go back to normal. There will be a new normal, which means that consumer behavior will likely change forever. Think deeply about your startup's culture, you know, not just your startup's product. A quote that I like from Phil Libin, the ex-CEO of Evernote, says that you know, your product is your product, but your culture is the next 100 products. So what is that startup culture for you? And then you know, when we're talking about creating optionality in product market fit, many CEOs tend to think of that very narrowly, but you know, that, that might become a little bit tricky. You might get stuck in something where you're basically building a product for a single unique consumer. Think more in terms of feature sets that address reasonably sized markets and that allow you to go into tangential markets as well. So an example that I want to share from one of our clients, Clevy, illustrates this really, really well. So they're in the business of ma making chat bots for all kinds of enterprise use cases. So when the crisis hit, they found that you know, enterprises no longer needed their product so much. So they adapted their product to meet uh, the challenges of the new healthcare crisis. Now they have a MythBuster bot as well as a triage bot that helps the common public address questions about you know, the current pandemic. Um, and it also helps healthcare facilities basically do a triage between cases that are urgent and require immediate help versus those that are not so critical. Um, and they're being integrated into the French Ministry of Health's uh, list of solutions currently. Finally, remember that speed matters. The faster you make these changes, even though they're hard, the more time you're going to buy for yourself. So, you know, do not delay your decisions because you have some idea of what that perfect decision might look like. You need to act now. But there are reasons to be hopeful. So I don't know if you guys noticed, but Paul Graham uh, from the Y Combinator tweeted uh, earlier this month that any startup that's you know, looking to raise cash or build itself during this time is disproportionately likely to succeed. Because if you think about what it takes to really succeed as an entrepreneur, grit and determination are definitely the most important qualities. Some of the very best VC investments actually happen during economic downturns. So Spotify raised with North Zone Ventures in 2008, Uber and Airbnb raised in 2009. The nature of work is changing forever, but so is the nature of many other things like socializing, entertainment, gaming, events. So this gives you a whole lot of opportunity to create new solutions going forward. So right now, everyone's talking about work from home tech, right? But there's also telemedicine, point of care diagnostics, gaming. There's a lot of innovation happening in many different sectors. Also, I think, you know, with the time we have now, we have a unique, a unique opportunity to think about what we want to do work-wise going forward. The, the Japanese have this interesting concept of ikigai, or finding purpose um, in the work you do. And really for them, this purpose will be the intersection of four things, right? One, it should be something that you like to do, what you like. Two, what you're good at. There has to be you know, some ability, inherent ability. Uh, three is what you can get paid for, and four is what the world needs. So when you have an intersection of these four things, you are in a state of ikigai and you'll be fulfilled in what you do. I think it's a powerful concept. 
Um, I wanted to end with some helpful AWS resources for founders. So we have, uh, for any founder that's bootstrapped or unbacked, a founder's tier, which basically gives you access to $1,000 of credits. Assuming you're a startup and you have a website, there, there's a list of uh, simple criteria that you need to fulfill. So please check that out with the link uh, provided here. For any startups that have been recently funded by a venture capital fund or an accelerator or an incubator, please reach out to us at this email address to learn about your perks. Then, you know, when we're talking about optionality, AWS gives you a, a unique way to do that by optimizing your cloud architecture, by making sure that, you know, your startup is able to be agile, but also scale its usage up or down, depending on the needs, um, you know, elasticity, and obviously optimize for cost, right? So we're actually doing um, a workshop on this topic, myself and our developer advocate, Sebastian Stormack, on the 15th of April. If you'd like to attend, please register here. And for any additional questions at all, please book a one-to-one -one session with our business or technical experts uh, at our AWS Startup Hub. And thank you very much for your attention. Now we're going to go to the second part of the session, which I'm very excited about, which is an interview with Bartosz from Alvin. Bartosz is a principal at Alvin. And he's been an investor for a long time. And I'm looking forward to the discussion that we're going to have uh, on a range of different topics. Uh, so please uh, feel free during our session also to type in your questions um, into the chat box and we'll be taking them at the end. Hi, everyone. I don't know if you could. I can hear you. I'll Good. You. Thank you All for right, having me. Gosh. How are you? Good. Good. How about you? Pretty good. Glad to have you with us. And delighted to be here. Thank you. Great. So Bartosz, maybe I'll start by, you know, given the times that we're going through right now, um, you know, just some historical perspective. So Alvin's been around since 1999. Uh, so you've seen a few ups and downs in the market as a fund. So can you just kind of walk us through Alvin's investment philosophy um, and the current brand identity that you have as a fund? Yeah, sure. Um, so indeed, we've been around for roughly 20 years. Uh, the founders, Guillaume and Charles, are, are still here every day. And um, and what we're trying to do is really like keep a cool head uh, with everything that we've learned over the years. So, of course, I personally haven't been there um, in, in, in 08 or 09, uh, nor in 2000. But, uh, but I think the Alvin investment philosophy hasn't really changed that much. It just like sort of mirrored the, the ecosystem. So funds number one to number three. So basically, year 2000 to 2013, we were mostly focused on, you know, so sort of medium risk, medium reward kind of companies, um, even though we were lucky enough to have like amazing companies um, and exits, including the likes of WebHelp, Sologé, PeopleDoc or, or, you know, Meilleurs Agents and companies like this. And then around like 2015, 16, the uh, European ecosystem and, and in particular the French ecosystem really sort of changed gear. Uh, and accelerated a lot. And um, and fund number four, which we raised in, in 2013, we started to invest in higher risk, but also higher reward type of companies uh, and profiles. And, and that was the moment when we invested in companies like Cezanne, Algolia, the Taiku, or, or Screen. Um, which is which was not necessarily a very conscious choice, like in, in in favoring this type of risk profiles, but it was just you know a consequence of the ecosystem growing and also talent being more available and and ambition growing and stuff like this because people in in France understood that it was possible to to build massive companies and they also were better equipped to do so with different um, different initiatives and 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 the family is obviously one of the um, entrepreneur education initiatives that really really helped so so of course we try to adapt to the market uh, but also try to to keep disciplined and to keep our head cool uh, when it comes to investment especially when it comes to you know the type of risk that we're taking the type of valuation that we're uh, ready to pay so sort of rain or sun we're trying to uh, trying to do what's what seems fair to us um, and this really reflects in our brand identity I think because we, we're trying to build it around 
you know something that we could, could call like straightforward honesty um, and 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 being super straightforward and and trying to be the most transparent with entrepreneurs because they, their scarcest resource is time and so let's just not waste it by uh, you know not being transparent with them and and let's optimize for the time. Okay, very helpful. So we will be diving deep into some of sure. those concepts later on. So maybe just to touch upon you know the types of investor investments that you've done as a fund as you said you know it's it's very varied in the type of investment you have a fashion brand like Cezanne you've got a dating app like Happen um you've got you know companies like Data IQ AIML or you know company like Algolia you know SaaS platform so what kind of entrepreneur is Alvin looking to back in all of this that's a really good question so we're indeed are investing in a diversity of sectors, um, and so this really shows that we're not so much of a thesis-driven investor, mm -hmm. uh, just because we think that there's a higher chance of the good idea coming from outside of our brains compared to from the inside of our brains. We're just six investors at Alvin, so a pretty small team, um, and so we're really looking for exceptional individuals that can sort of lead the way for us. Mm -hmm. um, and when it comes to defining a great entrepreneur. Obviously, we could like talk for hours about this, but uh, I like to 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 quote this uh, great sentence from uh, Naval Ravikant, the founder of uh, AngelList. Uh, so, a good founder is, is someone who has high energy, high intelligence, and high ethics. And what that means for us is, if we detail that a bit, is like high energy for us. It means basically three things. So. Someone who has grit, as you said before, uh, someone who's really relentless, uh, especially in, in tough times like today. Uh, it really takes a lot of grit to like go through it. Uh, the second thing is sort of a capacity to attract people, attract employees, attract you know potential partners, customers, investors, potential acquirers for the company. Um, and the third thing, the third part of this energy thing is sort of factor X around a unique insight on the market, a unique point of view of the market, something super highly differentiated that is hard to copy. And even with more time or more capital, other companies will not be able to copy that. So that's for the first the first thing. Then high intelligence. I will see same again, tons of different definitions of intelligence, but in the case of a startup start founder, it means someone who can adapt very quickly because the, the word changes quickly. You described it with, with the Black Swan or White Swan events. Um, someone who has a very high ability to learn, learn to hire, pe to hire people, uh, learn to become a CEO because you, you, you're not born a CEO, right? You become right. CEO. And then ability to articulate a compelling vision uh, step by step. Where are we going? How are we going to get there? And why are we the best position to get there? And finally, high ethics. Um, so here it's maybe more subjective, but transparency to us is super important uh, because we, we are here to work together. Um, I mean, the VC and the founder are both shareholders of the same company. So of course they, 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 they want the better option for the company. Uh, humility, because it's just one of the ways that transparency is, is, is expressing itself. And then some sort of inner drive to really accomplish a mission uh, and not being an entrepreneur, you know, just because it's 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 fancy and cool and 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 for the for the money. Mm -hmm. Icky guy. Exactly. Right. So, um, okay, I'll just you know ask the question that's on everyone's mind uh, and just get right to it, uh, whether it's awkward or not. Is Alvin mm -hmm. continuing to invest throughout this period? And if so, what are the sorts of things you might be looking for um, in a company? You know, compared to normal times. Um, yeah, it's a really interesting question because if if, if you read um, the so-called VC Twitter, and I and I really um, do not encourage you to do so uh, that much these days because it, it's really becoming a mess. But uh, people can get, conf and especially founders can get confused. Like, are we open for business? Not right. open for business? What does it mean? So if we if we just look at the, the facts, we we actually did sign a term sheet this week for for a new investment. Um, so it can happen. Um, However, it is true that, first of all, it's the team that we have known for a while. Um, we have tracked them for a while uh, over different meetings, and we can get back to that uh, later. Uh, it's in a space that we're quite familiar with, um, and we have some investments in that space. And indeed, the, the bar was was higher in terms of investment from us. And, and I'll just explain that because it's very difficult to understand um, for, for founders. 
just as you mentioned in your presentation, basically an investment for us is a conclusion of a risk reward sort of equilibrium. And obviously right now with the situation, we have a level of unknown. So the level of risk just went up pretty significantly. Mm -hmm. And so in order to compensate for that, the level of expected return that we're uh, expecting is obviously way higher. So we would uh, look for you know founders who are more compelling, uh, who are uh, tackling bigger markets, who, are, uh, who have a product that is even more differentiated, maybe for even stronger traction, stronger retention metrics, engagement metrics, and so on. So it just means that basically, every kind of things that we're looking at got a tiny bit more difficult uh but we are still like doing new deals and and, and we're still like talking to founders um uh, it's just that yeah it can take a little more time than usual because obviously uh, a big chunk of our time is spent on on internal portfolio work right. um then the valuation may also be lower uh just because of the consequences um, of two things first uh, uh since less vcs are investing then obviously there would be less competition and 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 the, you know the price um, price finding mechanism is a, a result of competition as fred destin said earlier today but also the later stage uh rounds can can, can can be lower and as a result in terms of investment amount and as a result with lower valuation and so on and this sort of trickles down to the earlier stages investments but we can get back to this later okay very useful so again i wanted to go back to uh, the different sectors in which alvin invests so um you know the way uh, i see it there's mainly three sectors where alvin has exposure there's SaaS, there's marketplace there's consumer so just in terms of broad patterns that you're seeing uh, maybe in your portfolio companies or in the wider market in general are there sectors where you think entrepreneurs are more vulnerable than others and are there sectors conversely where an entrepreneur is more resilient for sure so it's um so indeed, we, we we do invest in these uh, three areas. Um, then I'm I'm to be honest, I'm, I'm not sure that uh, the, this lens is the right one to look at it uh, because actually there are other axes to 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 look at when when we actually see what's happening. Uh, so SaaS marketplaces and and mobile consumer are business models rather than sectors. And so um, if we if we if we basically um, look at it from a sector point of view, the way we see the different impacts in our portfolio is basically we can we can split it into three buckets. The first one is what companies have a strong negative impact on the on the revenue and even like existential risk on the startup. So like minus 50 to minus 100 percent of the revenue. Mm -hmm. And we expect that to happen in the sectors of travel, hospitality, uh, which, which are sectors we're not very exposed to, to be honest. So we're quite lucky on, on, on this front, but also everything related to retail services that happen in real life mobility a bit, uh, physical goods as well, like direct-to-consumer stuff. If you have a supply chain that is heavily dependent on, you know, uh, different countries, mm -hmm. manufacturing in China, stuff like this, obviously it can be it can be more difficult, but also HR-related stuff uh, because obviously companies are hiring uh, on a, at a slower pace. So if your business model depends on, like, taking commission of company on companies hiring, then it can be difficult. So that's the first category. Then you would have... Another one where the impact is negative, but it's not that negative. Uh, so rather limited overall, like minus 20 to minus 30%. Mm -hmm. um, and that's oftentimes what we see in B2B SaaS. Mm -hmm. Because the business model of uh, having recurring revenue is extremely healthy and it's ex an extremely good business model. And so unless you have a lot of churn, basically your your revenue is quite resilient. Uh, so, so these are companies that are somewhat impacted, but not very much. And we're lucky enough to have a lot of them in a the portfolio. And then you have the third bucket, which is actually positively impacted. And these are the sectors of mobile consumer. So gaming, dating, as I said, um, social. We, we also have a lot of them in the portfolio, which are which are actually benefiting from the current situation. Or really? interesting. People yeah. are going on dates now? So it's, it's, it's funny because, um, so the whole, the whole value proposition of Happen is um, basically find online who you've um, met offline, uh, cross path with offline. Obviously, we don't met so uh, we don't meet so many people offline these days. Uh, but another part of dating is also just you know 
ego boosting and and just meeting new people and spending time it's just like instagram versus happen and you, you can spend 10 minutes on, on on one or the other so yeah actually uh we we see a positive impact on mobile consumer stuff Very nice. so so this would be from a sector point of view and and then you have like other ways of looking at it from from for instance um it's it's like being mission critical versus being a nice to have um, it's it's something that VCs often use as a lingo, and and founders don't really oftentimes understand it. But the nice to have budgets are the first one to be cut uh, when it's when 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 it's difficult. And in times of a bull market, nothing feels like a nice to have, right? Uh, and everybody is buying all sorts of uh, services that can optimize like the, the last two five percent of, of of their business uh, when it's all rosy. But when it's not, then you actually know like. What, what is really mission critical? What, what are people ready to pay for? Um, and what they're not ready to pay for. So this is actually um, quite interesting to see. And maybe a last point to address here is actually the companies that are the hardest hit are the ones that are on a certain scale. Because uh, obviously when you have like, almost zero revenue or zero revenue, the delta is very small. And uh, oftentimes you have a very, very limited burn at that time. But when you're you know, a company with several hundred, hundreds of employees and a lot of revenue, and then all of a sudden it goes to zero, uh, then you still have a high fixed cost base and, and you have zero revenue to compensate for it. So, so this is, this is really, really difficult. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. So uh, I wanted to revisit something that you said before uh, around grit. Yeah. So, you know, when you think about the wartime CEO mentality, you know, we're talking about frugality, we're talking about laser sharp focus, constant, ruthless yeah. prioritization. So in, in some sense, these are qualities that VCs like to have in their CEOs anyway, when they're being funded. Do you think that this kind of exaggerated version of these qualities um, that crises like this um, kind of you know bring forth. Do you, do you think in general crises help select for the types of companies that will make it in the end? So yeah, I mean it, it probably pr probably makes it slightly easier for us to to pick first first of all because I, I mean even if we're um, like uh, maybe not as usual but we're we're uh, rather open for business but like I have to say that even the inbound deal flow it has almost completely stalled. Like we, we used to receive a lot of inbound deal flow and, and now it's practically zero. Uh, so we also have more time. So obviously it makes it easier for us to pick, but to be honest, I mean, a crisis is, is, is not a good thing for, for anyone. So, 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 so I would not be uh, super, um, super happy about that. But what is true is that, that the very best founders and oftentimes also it so, tends to correlate with the most experience are the ones that actually act on a new context very quickly and very effectively because they anticipate, they preempt different topics, they come up with solutions very, very quickly. So they're cutting their burn rate, they're looking for cash from any source, just as you mentioned before. Um, they're trying their best to keep the team morale very high. Uh, they're refocusing the energy of the company on you know things that actually matter and things that actually have an impact. So product development, existing customer base, um, uh, prospects that are very, very far in the funnel and with a high probability of closing and, and stuff like this. So, so it, those signals, we see them better in a, in a, in a time of crisis for sure. Uh, but that being said, like being a founder is extremely difficult, even in, 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 in good times. So in bad times, it's, it's um, even tougher. Mm -hmm. True. And so amongst those qualities, um, I wanted to focus on, you know, communication and transparency, yep. which you brought up earlier. So how do you see that really, you know, how transparent should a founder be, um, you know, with the investor and how transparent does the investor need to be with a founder of a portfolio company that's maybe in trouble? You know, are they going to be helping them through it? How do you see that? Sure. So... You know, there should always be 100% transparency between founders and, and investors, like in both directions, first. And second, irrespective of like being in a bull market or bear market, there, there, there should be no difference. Then, of course, in a, in a tough situation, it's always more difficult because you, you, don't, want the, you don't want to be the bearer of bad news, right? Um, 
And, but it's actually quite paradoxically even more important in a context of, 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 of difficulties because you need to act fast and there's no time for salesiness, no time for you know reading between the lines and stuff like this. So on the investor side, I think investors have to be very, very upfront about first the refinancing conditions, uh, like under what conditions will I refinance your business if you are in trouble, uh, provide a feedback which is fast, which is clear, which, does, which doesn't change over time, uh, also like stability and having, um, and, and you know, staying the course is super important for, for, uh, for a VC. And also it has to be checked with, um, with the whole partnerships. So, so the, the, the partner in charge of one company, portfolio company, has to check with the rest of the partnership for, for a common decision that is actually like binding. And also, ideally, has to check with the LPs because what has mm -hmm. happened uh, is um, not at Alvin, fortunately, but um, you know, LPs blocking a capital call, and then uh, you know, VC can VCs cannot. Uh, in turn, um, honor their commitment to founders just because LPs did not honor their commitment to the VC. So that's that's also something really important. Is like check with every stakeholder uh, that what you're saying actually like, is actually binding for you. Uh, and for founders, you have to tell the bad news immediately. Like do not you know sugarcoat it, um, but also. Do your due diligence on what you actually can and cannot do in terms of cost cutting. Um, you can always do more than what you think, uh, and so you can. You, you really need to have a, a very, very clear view on what is and isn't essential. Um, and 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 I think you can actually realize that not many things are essential. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. So I, maybe I'll ask you one final question sure. before we turn to the public for questions. So. Um, just in terms of you know what is likely to work uh, as a pitch for Alvin, let's say six to twelve months down the line, what can a founder do today, um, you know, in order to make sure that they have a good story to tell you when they come to look for funds six to twelve months down the line? Sure. Um, so never never waste a good crisis. Uh, that, that would be the, the the first thing. So I think this crisis can be an accelerated truth test for, for many founders, uh, for many questions that founders might have or, or might even not know that they have. Uh, so first of all, what, what founders can can do to take advantage of the situation and also to, to like, to be honest, to impress us uh, as, a, as a second step is be extremely data driven, uh, both quantitatively by looking in details at your numbers, at what's actually happening in your numbers, because you you might expect some co some consequences of, of the situation and actually notice some different consequences in, in the data, but also qualitatively by talking to your customers. That that's that's maybe the most important thing. Um, and and also as everyone is is becoming more cash conscious, uh, that may be a great time to actually stress test your product market fit uh, because in a time of crisis uh, you can really identify who is ready to pay for what um, and basically you can identify who has the highest engagement the highest willingness to pay despite of the context so this is actually really really great for companies that are in search for a product market fit because everything is just happening faster uh, in terms of like uh, ability to churn or to adopt the solution, um, we see that with with you know adoption timelines of of work from home technologies, but also like telehealth and stuff like this. Um, I think like uh, I read that Dr. Lee does a hundred thousand uh, teleconsultations per day. I mean, it's, it's pretty it's pretty amazing, right? I, I, I think I, I'm not an insider here, but uh, um, I would expect that they had it in their business plan for like 20, 2025 or something. Uh, so so it's pretty. Amazing. The second thing is, I would suggest them to focus on existing customers, uh, trying to prevent churn as much as possible. It's way easier to uh, to, to basically build revenue with, with your existing customers as opposed to uh, going and, and hunting for other customers. So reach out to them. You know, do the extra mile to to help them achieve their own business objectives. Offer discounts. Offer you know three three months for 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 some for, for for some some time so even if it costs you a bit more in terms of customer success in terms of you know downgrading and stuff like this you will earn advocates basically that will uh, help you get back on track faster uh when it's all over and the third thing would be 
focus on product development because on the sales and marketing side, there's not so much to be done, to be honest. Um, so you want to keep your marketing dollars for, for the survival. Uh, so focus on your product, make it highly differentiated, focus on your NPS and focus on metrics like this. And, and this is exactly what we'll be looking for um, as we go out of the, the situation, because we know that you know growth rate like 2.5, 3x year on year right now, it's very difficult to achieve unless you're in this very, very specific niche of positively impacted companies. Um, so what we will be looking at is, super highly differentiated product and super sound uh, value proposition and very very high engagement and retention because we know that traction might not be the right metric to look for uh in six nine months excellent thank you very much for that so i suggest we take a look at some of the questions sure. that people have been sending in so i have a question here from bilal who says uh Venture is a, a very creative space when it comes to crafting deal terms. So what can we expect on this side from Alvin, you know, in terms of pay to play um, or, you know, new instruments, like are you using convertible debt, et cetera, as um, invested instruments? What's going on on that front? So that's a really good question. So yeah, I mean, when I started in venture in, in late 2014, um, it we, we were not in a bear market, but we were not in the bull market that really started in 2015, 16, 17. Um, and so at that time, there were still uh, some term sheets with like uh, fancy terms, uh, you know, double deep, pay to play, stuff like this. Um, and we are, I actually it took a lot of time, I think, for the ecosystem and in particular for the European ecosystem to get rid of these toxic terms, uh, which are really very much about protecting the downside as opposed to like maximizing the upside, which our job should be about. Um, so You're not founder friendly. Exactly. And 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 so to be honest, I'm 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 not really looking forward to like seeing those terms back. Uh, our term sheets at Alvin, or at least the the the, the one that we signed this week, and and um, and potentially another one that we have uh, in, in in preparation, are to totally plain vanilla, um, no fancy terms, uh, super you know simple term sheets. The, the same that the same as we were sending uh, a year ago, two years ago, three years ago in terms of terms. Okay, great to hear. Um, I have a question from Mark. I think I will take this one. He says, mm -hmm. laser sharp and optionality usually don't go very well together. Opposing statements there. How do you feel about razor sharp focus in good times and optionality in bad times? Um, interesting. So yes, indeed, you know, the, the whole point of optionality is to not lock yourself down to a single outcome. And so, yeah, when I said optionality, it's really what you should have in the back of your mind at all times. So think of optionality as your insurance. And the worst thing that you can try to do with insurance is try to time it, right? Um, so you need to have that in mind at all times uh, and build everything around that concept. So the razor sharp focus really comes from something else. You know, given that you are now um, in you know, a wartime CEO mode, you need to be very focused about how you're going to get your company out of this situation and last for the next 12 months, right? So in terms of conserving cash, making hard decisions, letting go of people if you need to, raising a bridge round or whatever. So the, the focus needs to be around making your company survive. But yeah, optionality is absolutely what you should be thinking about in terms of you know going forward and, and always, really, that's the baseline. Sure. Okay. Maybe one question is from Julien here. Um, any new categories that you, we are looking at, which we were not looking at before the crisis? So, so again, like as I said in the very beginning, we, we're trying to to keep disciplined and 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 to take take some perspective on things and and keep our head cool. So we will not like completely pivot uh, 360, uh, 180 degrees our investment thesis. Um, so so I'm not sure, but what what is true is that the adoption curves for some products have been accelerated pretty dramatically. So we might look for more. Um, more deals into sectors that have been 
somehow disrupted by software, but not so much. So like we, we, we just ventured like a few months ago into our first health tech deal, which was Cardiologues. And we, we, we might want to do some more deals in this space. Um, but we also might want to do more software tools that are empowering the passion economy because uh, I mean, there's the, the like offline fitness went to zero. You, you cannot go to a gym, you cannot go to a yoga studio, whatever. But what we see is like more and more yoga teachers doing the same thing on Instagram uh, for live sessions and then monetizing through, you know, tipping through Lydia. Uh, so this is, I mean, these are like five different products that are used. Um, and 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 maybe there, there's a space here to, to do some sort of product. I don't know, I'm thinking it out here, but uh, passion economy is for sure. Uh, something that we're very interested in um and also you know maybe more 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 automation uh, and i think maybe something which will which will stick i hope so at least is people have actually realized that uh, their biggest asset is their own health so maybe we will be slightly more um diligent uh towards what we eat how we exercise how we sleep uh how we breathe and everything and and i think we actually don't know that much about all these things. Like I'm al always surprised about how little we, we know about nutrition, about you know sleep and stuff like this. So I hope there will be more digital products helping this and, and helping, you know, educating people around just feeling well and being well and mental health is something and, and social health is something. So I think there's a lot of products to build around this just because people are realizing how, how much their health matters. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think we have another question from Mark. Uh, so I think the first part of the question you already answered, the second part has to do with capital calls and LPs. So how, how is that relationship going now? I mean, we, we, we didn't have problems so far on, on, on the uh, capital call uh, side. Uh, what can happen, I mean, if we, if we zoom out a bit, um, I think what's what's happening is that basically, so the VCs obviously are are taking money from LPs, and LPs are hit in a very very. Um, there's a variety of impacts on the LP side. So, on the corporate LP side, for instance, um, themselves are very badly hit. Uh, sure. So they're just like fighting for survival. So obviously, uh, investing as a as an LP in a VC fund is is not exactly a top priority for them. Uh, so that's one thing. Family offices are also quite oftentimes related to a cornerstone corporate. Uh, if they're managing money, like coming out from an operating company, that they, they might be very badly hit. Um, and what's happening on the institutional investor side, which which we have a lot of at, at, uh, at Alvin, is that they basically allocate their um, investment pockets uh, across different asset classes. And VC is oftentimes a very, very tiny asset class, like one to 2% max of their uh, amount of the management. But what's happening is that actually the value of their other assets, stocks, bonds, real estate, went down pretty dramatically. So in mechanically, their exposure to VC went up to like five, six, seven percent um, and oftentimes beyond thresholds that they they, they are allowed uh, to, to have as exposure to VC. So that, that's really something that, that, that has to be taken into account here. Um, so they need to correct for that over allocation. Exactly. Uh, and like, hopefully this will only happen through, uh, you know, not investing in any new VC funds. Mm -hmm. But in, in the worst case, it can also uh, happen through, you know, selling their position in a VC fund. And then, yeah. then there's a secondary market of position in VC funds, which is very complicated. And then, you know, stuff like this, which can basically uh, be, be, be quite tough. But so far, we, we haven't been impacted um, at all. Okay, great. So I think we're almost at the end of the time allocated to us, but because we started a couple of minutes late, I will allow myself to ask you one general question. Sure. Uh, so for any founder that's starting to court a VC starting now, so we know that VCs like to see the film rather than a snapshot. They need to build a relationship with um, a founder. Yeah. So, you know, let's say earlier on, you'd go get coffee with this founder. Now that everyone's working remotely and you're, you know, reduced to video conferencing and so on, do you have any practical advice on how they might build this relationship with VCs? Sure. So maybe, 
yeah, two or three things here. So first of all, target your VC really well. Um, I think, you know, not all VCs are, are are the same in terms of, you know, their ability to lead the round, their ability to to understand your, your industry really well with a, an established track record in the industry, like who, um, like who's the best partner at your stage uh, and, and, and who can put more money also if needed down the line. Uh, so really target your VCs really well. Um, I know we VCs are not the best at basically communicating. So on our websites and stuff, you, 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 you maybe won't have all the information, but just ask for it. Uh, like, for instance, my email address is, is in my LinkedIn handle. So it's, it's pretty public. Um, so ask us for it. So first thing, second thing is indeed create the relationship as early as possible. Uh, and I know it has been difficult because with, with the amount of money, money that has been poured into VC over the past years, um, there, there was many, many. There were many, many funds uh, that basically were willing to get in touch with the same founders. So obviously, um, they were completely drowning in, in, in you know, um, requests from VCs like uh, let's have a meeting and so on. And so they, some founders used to take the meetings very, very late and just during their actual fundraising process. Okay. And, and this is, I mean, it's completely understandable, but but it's very, very difficult for, for us to, to, to say that we will build a relationship over seven years uh, because that's our average holding time, um, just after two weeks of, of like a few meetings. So once you have that list of VCs that you want to talk to, just like don't hesitate to talk to them in advance, let them know about how you're progressing, be super transparent, say, these are the questions that I have. Uh, these are the assumptions that I'm that I'm using. This is how I'm going to test these assumptions. And actually, I don't know about my go-to-market, for instance, uh, but I will try these different channels and and monitor them and get back to you and say, oh, uh, actually, content doesn't work, but uh, it just so happens that partnerships uh, work really well. So maybe uh, maybe you have other companies in your portfolio that have scale partnerships or stuff like this. So just like engage in, in in some you know transparent conversations uh, around your business and and um, I would say yeah that's uh, that's maybe the the, the best uh, thing I can advise. Otherwise, you know, it's just too early. We, we we've been the, in, in in quarantine for four weeks now in France. Um, as I said, we we've signed one term sheet, but it actually was started engaging with the company before. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it's hard to say if, if you know, if Zoom can replace um, a physical meeting or not, but uh, I think it can. Time will tell. You'll have to come back and tell us sure. what, what came out of this uh, quarantine period, if you've got any glad. hot deals a few months uh, down the line. Thank I'd you so much, Bartosz. Thank you for having pleasure me. having you and chatting with you. I hope that the founders present got some great insights from, from our conversation. Um, and I think now we all go network.